This is Drom Shakasuto. Thanks for watching. Please remember to subscribe and like this video. Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. Besiat Adishmaya, the Taverat Halev Shelaisha Israeli, Lehen Shiur Verech, the flaming fire of the, of the Israeli heart. You can never estimate, you can never measure, you can never understand the power of the soul of of the believer. We can see that in our hearts that flame of fire is making such changes and giving us such enormous superpower to, to change our lives, to change our habits, our old patterns, to, to benefit ourselves, to progress, to be different, to go to, to different levels in our lives and where all that energy coming from, it's coming from within, it's coming from our souls. Now, you have souls in this world that are suffering so bad, that don't find no comfort and no joy and no happiness and no satisfaction in their lifetime. You have souls that are so broken, that are suffering from such sadness and, and, and dark bitterness and such horrible depression. People are getting suicidal, people are losing their mind, distracting their thoughts, hours and hours, days and days with their phone, with their mobile, with their internet, with television, with music, with drugs, with alcohol. Don't want to feel, don't want to experience, don't want to be, don't want to, to be part of this world. Cannot understand why in the world it happened to them that they came down to this world. Cannot find no taste, no reason, no salvation, no, no satisfaction. Not in the pure and holy sides of this world can't find satisfaction in mitzvot, can't find satisfaction in Torah, cannot enjoy davening, praying, cannot enjoy synagogues, cannot enjoy going to inspiring lectures, cannot enjoy, cannot find no satisfaction in all those things. Their mind is so distracted. And when they're going to try to look for joy and for comfort in the foreign side, in the dark side, in lusts and desires, cannot find happiness. Even if they're sinning, even if they're satisfying and pleasuring their bodies, they cannot find comfort in it at all. They're finding themselves alone in their own houses, in their chambers, in their rooms, in their own darkness. People are cutting themselves, people are, 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 are scratching themselves, people are climbing the walls, people are, are making tattoos and, and bleeding and crying and screaming for help. People are posting their emotions and their sorrow online, on Facebook, on Instagram. People are committing suicide on daily basis and those souls are are our souls, those are brothers and sisters of us, those are people that are so close to us and they're struggling. They cannot find no comfort and no happiness in their life and 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 the only thing that makes them feel a little bit better is if they find other people that are in a way like them, but also the fact that they feel that they're not alone, if they have a point of truth is also not satisfying them and not helping them, not comforting them because they want the salvation. And to see that other people are also in the same sorrow, in the same swamp of despair, doesn't bring you up, doesn't uplift your spirit. It at least makes you understand that something goes wrong in this world, that something is... is, is, is that you're not crazy to suffer, that you're not alone, but still those souls are searching for salvation, searching for a solution for their sorrow. And we know that we have people that today 
the the medicine and and, and the science are, are defining those people. Therapists are defining those people as ADD, as, as uh, with all kind of, of mental sicknesses and 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 distractions. But all those things are coming from trauma. All of those things are coming from huge, huge pains and traumas that, that took place in our lives. And because that we cannot go back to those horrible, horrible emotions, to those terrifying moments of fear and, and, and guilt, so people are running away and, and letting their mind wander and go around and, and, and be distracted and they don't and can't focus in one thing and don't want to feel it, don't want to, don't want to experience and, and, and afraid to love and to be loved and they cannot trust no one. And we must find and come up with a solution. So I'm trying as a person with faith to, to give guidings and advice to those souls and also to guide myself out of my own sadness and, and out of my own despair and lack of faith. And I see that many times even when you're trying to work so hard on your own faith and to, and to cheer up yourself and to be strong, certain things in life are just breaking you to pieces. Certain situations that you find yourself with the face to the wall, that you don't have a solution. And even if you try to, to find solutions in the words of the Bible, in the words of Torah, in the words to quote Chachamim, wise um, um, scholars that, 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 that said amazing and super inspiring words of, 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 of hope, you try to bring those verses into your life and it doesn't match. And it's so hard to... To, 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 to recover by those amazing words of, of, of those wise and, and, and what we're going to do to tell a person that is suffering that cannot find comfort in nothing in his life to tell him look it's all for the good it's all for the best Hashem the Creator He loves you are you kidding me? He looked at you like you came out of space. What are you talking about? Who loves me? What is love? What is hope? Who loves me? What is for the good? What do you mean? It's all bad. It's all dark. It's all foreign. I hate it. I hate you. Who are you? Why are you talking to me? It's like you're talking to a person that is a ball of fire. You're talking to, to someone that, that feels satisfaction and joy from... from from, from cutting himself. You have people that are scratching themselves until they're bleeding with, with knives. And you, you have people that, that satisfaction, that joy is a foreign word for them. You cannot talk to them about pleasure. Nothing pleasures them. They're afraid to close their eyes at night. They don't want to go to sleep. They cannot go to sleep. They're afraid from their own dreams. They're afraid to be alone. They feel so alone, they don't have no one to talk, and they're afraid to talk. And if you're going to try to open a conversation with them, they, they're going to close the doors on you. They don't want to hear you. They want to suffer and they want to die. That's what they want. And some of them are even not afraid to die, just they didn't came yet to that decision of taking their lives in their hands. Some people are dreaming of death. People are hoping to die. Are you going to save those souls? That's the question. How are you going to go, first of all, to the depths of those souls? How are you going to understand them to give them a hand? Because now, by quoting amazing, holy verses from fantastic, inspiring books, won't do the job. Tell them it's all for the good. There is a purpose for your sorrow. The Creator, He loves you. You don't know that path already been carved and designed and written for you from six days of creation. He wants to kill you. The Creator, Father of mercy, you're calling Him? He designed my path? Is there a cr more cruel idea than, than that path that I experienced in my life? Someone suffered more than I? Someone with my vessels, with my tools? People been raped, people been abused, people been molested, people been hurt, been humiliated in thousand ways by their parents, by their siblings, by their best friends, by like, by their rabbis, by their teachers, by their whoever that was supposed to give them confidence and, and comfort and, and security and love, betrayed them and turned their back on them. So 
how are you going to understand those souls? How are you going to come to those people and going to be one with them? It's written on Moshe Rabbeinu, on the main righteous prophet of all generations, that he was, it's written on him, Sar Mikol Vachol. And Rabbi Nachman of Breslev, that righteous man, is explaining that verse. When you say Sar, you mean he moved away, Mikol Vachol, from everything. On Moshe, Moshe Rabbeinu, it's written that he moved away from everything, that he was not part of anything. Rabbi Nachman of Breslev explains the meaning of that verse on Moshe Rabbeinu, on Moses. And he's saying on him that whenever he saw a person that was so far that he couldn't be involved with nothing that, that, that holds purity and holiness and good, someone that is in complete darkness, so Moshe Rabbeinu was leaving everything behind him. He stopped being religious. He stopped keeping Shabbat. He stopped eating kosh. Not that he was violating Shabbat. He just dropped it all behind him. He couldn't care less about all of those things. And he went to be with that one. If he would see someone sits on the sidewalk out of the synagogue, he would go out of the synagogue and sit with him on the sidewalk and start chatting with him. What are you talking? What are you hearing? What is the music? What, is, what are, you, are you doing? What are, oh, you're a videographer. Oh, you're making movies. Oh, you're what, oh, what are you watching? What do you have on your iPhone? What are you playing with? What are you doing? Oh, it's a, a nice tattoo. That's what you have. He was going to those souls to be with them. And why? Rabbi Nachman of Breslev is saying, because he felt that he is one of them. He felt that he is one of them. When you think to yourself that you are different that someone, than someone else because he is lower than you, or that you are thinking about yourself that you are higher than him, that's, where, that's the point that you lost your connection to that soul. You divided yourself from him. But if you will sit with him, you will see that you are sitting with a very clever, sensitive and amazing person with an illuminating soul so fragile and kind and gentle that you will be amazed. But you need to give him a chance for that. So you must break your own arrogance, your own self-importance and break yourself to pieces to understand that if Hashem, the Creator, would put you in the same tests like that person, you would sit in the same place on the sidewalk with him and you wouldn't be in the synagogue. You wouldn't be sitting and learning Gemara, Talmud, Mishnah, Zohar Kadosh. You wouldn't have that chance. If the Creator would take you in a path of suffering, of being abused, of being raped, of being molested, you wouldn't have the ability to sit today and to learn and to focus your mind and to be a doctor or a lawyer. You wouldn't have those abilities because you would be terrified. Who is knocking? What's going on? Who is walking? Who is crossing the street? What are those people are doing? Everything was a threat for you and you would be terrified, afraid of your own shadows, wouldn't recognize yourself in the mirror, hating your eyeballs, looking at your face and, and wanting to kill yourself. It depends in the kindness of the world to the person. His spiritual level depends and been set only because of what that he experienced in life. And even on yourself, you must have that merciful eyes to judge yourself favorably and also to understand yourself that you're not holding today in the high levels of the righteous ones only because that you have some reasons not to. I remember myself when I was 11, when I was 12, I had friends in the neighborhood that I lived in. We were living in, an, in a secular neighborhood and the religious neighborhoods are not better than those. But in my life story, we lived in a secular neighborhood. Most of the kids in our block, in our street, they were two years older than I. They're, mm, um, uh, they've been more mature and, and learned much more nonsense than I in, when we spend time together. And they made me, as their friend, involved in things of people of two years, like kids of two years elder than me. 
And everything that they learned when they were 13 and 14, I learned when I was 11 and 12. And they burned my mind, and they burned my heart, and they burned my happiness and my joy. And they took me to such foreign and dark places because I was not even... Also for them it wasn't proper, it wasn't the right thing to do, but at least they were 14, at least they were 15 when they, like, they were somewhere else. But I was in total shock, I didn't understand, but I had to be part of the, the, the gang, part of that group, part of those friends of mine from, from school, from, from the street, from the neighborhood. I had to join them, I had to, and I was two, three years younger than them. And they burnt my heart. Life burnt my heart. So now I'm checking myself. Great, you're 39 and you don't have a heart. How can I judge myself on not having a heart if I can remember and remind myself exact points in my life that my heart been burnt in those places? If I remember walking for 19 days in Amsterdam when I was 18 years old, going to the most filthiest clubs in Amsterdam, to the darkest places, darkest dungeons in Amsterdam for after parties in, in Shabbos morning, after consuming the worst kind of drugs in the world, with no mind, with no happiness, with no hope, and seeing filthy things in front of my eyes, how can I even hope not to have that trauma, not to be burned, not to be traumatized by those things that I experienced in my life. How you can judge yourself on your weaknesses, on your fears, on, on your lackings, on your scars. If you've been wounded and now you're scarred, what do you want from yourself? You've been to a car accident, you've been to a spiritual car accident, your spiritual car been damaged, been run into another vehicle, spiritual vehicle, and you've been hit in the face, in the heart, in your kidneys, in your lungs, and now you're suffocating. Now it's hard for you to breathe. It's hard for you to circulate. It's hard for you to, to, to refresh yourself, to grow, to understand. You're afraid, you're confused, you're worried, you have so many fears, and you're so confused today, and you keep on forgetting certain things. How can you judge yourself on that? You cannot. You must reveal the mercy, the kindness of the Creator on those people and especially on yourself because before that you go through that journey on yourself, on your own, you won't have those tools, those abilities to judge other people favorably. First and, and, and most necessary tool for you to help other people is that you will have the same compassion on yourself, that you will reveal understanding and, and patience on yourself, that you will walk with yourself step by step, go back with your memories, try to understand how certain things destroyed your happiness, how certain things in your lifetime destroyed your hope and your faith and your confidence, because when you were a child, when you were three months old, you were okay. When you were one year old, you were okay. When you were two years old, you were okay. Everything was okay. Oh, but when you were three, then problems start revealing, coming above the surface. Why? Because you started to understand that your parents are not the best friends in the world and that there are issues and that money is a problem and that to move apartments it's not an easy thing and that you must do that and that you must go into a house that you don't like and then that you must do this and that and that people are liars and they can cheat you and stab you in the back. And okay, when you're three years old and five and seven years old, you're like a clean sponge. You're, you're soaking everything, every detail that you experienced in your area, in your zone was affecting you and changing your colors for good forever. And today you're not who that you were when you came down to this world and you need to work on yourself to rewash yourself to clean and cleanse and purify yourself. And those things can be done only by patience and love and understanding. Only. All you need is love. Da, na, na. All you need is love, love, love. Love is all you need.
Love is all you need, and without love, you cannot heal yourself. Like that, you cannot heal someone else if you don't love him. Because when he feels that you don't love him, you became his enemy, and that's it. And there's no conversation anymore. That, please, you know, my friend, leave me alone. You're religious, and I'm not. Okay, let's keep distance. Okay, you're Jewish, and I'm not. You know, you're from that school, you're from that community. You're this, you're that. Dividing started. Walls are being, are being built because the lack of love. But when you love each other, you don't care what his religion, you don't care what his color, you don't care what his sex, you don't care about his heights, his degrees, you don't care about how rich he is, you don't mind if he's poor, if he's wise, if he's married, he's got children, doesn't. You don't care. You love him and you will do whatever it takes to help him. And when he feels that from you, so he immediately will open his heart. So for some people, it's harder than the rest. They've been hurt so many times by those people that were supposed to be the, those ones that were supposed to love them. But if you will insist, if you will continue, if you're not going to back off on loving them, they will open up again. They will not gonna close their do doors forever. But to succeed in that, first of all, you need to, to beat, to defeat your own evil inclination. Your own evil inclination is not your sins, is not your crimes, is not your mistakes, is not your failures. Those are the results of you following the inner voice of your evil inclination. Again, your evil inclination is not the fact that you lied, is not the fact that you failed, is not the fact that you were violating Shabbos or not eating kosher. The reason that you were not eating kosher or lying or cheating or doing something wrong was because that you were following the voice of your evil inclination that was corrupting your way of looking at things. He was distracting your thoughts from being positive and happy and good to be sad and depressed and angry and frustrated. And because of your sadness, because that you followed those advice that aimed you to be sad, that offered you sadness on happiness, bitterness on, 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 on being joyful and, 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 and happy. Because of that, because that you followed that advice of the evil inclination, you started to sin and you chose to do things against your happiness and to hurt yourself and to hurt other people. So the sins and the crimes and the mistakes and the failures are only the result of you following the negative thoughts, the sad thoughts that were moving you away from who that you are. But your war against the evil inclination is to fight against the negativity and to become positive again. To do tshuva, to come back to the Creator, it's to give yourself a chance. It's to love yourself. It's to give yourself another opportunity to succeed and to be who that you are. If you have a desire to accomplish something, you have a dream, you must go and accomplish that and do it and to make it happen in your life. Even if it will take you 20 years or 70 years, you're not allowed to back off from your goals, from your dreams. And when your dreams will come true, you'll understand why it was so important. Because you're on a mission. And that mission is an, a mission in the land of the enemy in the dark side of the world, in the physicality, in the darkness. You are here as a messenger of the Creator to do something. You're on a mission. You're an eternal soul, an endless soul that is coming from an endless world, from eternity. You came down to this world and now you're disguised. Now you are hidden. Now you're wrapped. Now you're covered with a physical body. And now in that body, 
you are hidden in a certain family and that family is hidden in a certain house and that house is hidden in a certain block, in a certain neighborhood, part of some community and you in that house have a certain job, a purpose and you need to find that purpose and to let the fire of your soul and to make a change in that section of the universe and by that you will reveal godliness. You will reveal the real shades and real colors, the real qualities of your souls. That is the, those are the treasures. That is the treasure that's been given to you. Those are the tools that have been given to you by the Creator when He sent your soul into that body. He sent a soul with qualities, with certain power, with certain wisdom, certain abilities. Some of us can stand pressure. Some of us can, not, can be strong against shames and insultings. Some of us, I, I heard about people, that righteous people that guided their students and told them, listen, your mission in life is only one. Don't commit suicide. Don't kill yourself. That's your mission. Don't kill yourself. Every other person would kill himself if he would be you. You have the ability to go through all of that hell and not to die. And not to kill yourself and to go and to give hope to other people that are in similar situation and to give them advice. If they will listen to me, they won't buy my lesson. But you, with your scars, with your tattoos, with your piercing, with your um, um, surfing board on the way to the beach, they will listen to you. Why are they going to listen to you? Because you look familiar. Because you're talking in the same language. And if you're going to talk to them on a point that is bothering both of you, and you have a life experience in that point, but you can add a sense, a drop of hope to that point that you both struggle with, you can save his life. And I cannot. Because who am I? He will look at me, an enemy. Marked me. That's it. Erased me. Moved. Why? Because I look different to him. So I don't have the right disguise, I don't have the right uniform to save his life. And you do. So you must believe in yourself that you, even that you are scarred, and even that you are wounded, and even that you cannot remember the number of your shoes, the size of your shoes, and you're so confused and lost, and you don't know where to put filin and when, and you don't know when is Shabbat, and what do you mean, and Jewish and not Jewish, and Halakha, and Pesach, what do you mean, Passover what, and you don't, can't understand the message and Judaism, and nothing is, 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 is is close to you, everything is so far and foreign for you, but you are a believer and you carry a holy soul inside of you, you must believe that you're in a mission. Because why in the world that you will have such a holy soul that desires good, that wants to help other people? If not that that is the purpose of your life, to go and to rescue and to save lives of people. With no differences, with no dividing, with no change of color, of, of sex, of nations. Of, who cares? Now you were able to save a squirrel. Who cares? It's a squirrel. It's not a human being. Won't you be happy? I'm going to celebrate a, a, a month, a whole year I'm going to celebrate. I saved a squirrel. I'm going to be so happy. I saved a squirrel. Today he was about to be eaten, to be run by a truck, and I saved that squirrel. You're going to, no, I'm going to save only the holy ones. Why? Why won't you just be normal and go and do good in the world and save the ones that are around you, the ones that are available to you, the ones that wants to hear from you? They're not important enough. Hashem, the creator of the universe, sent you with a certain language, with a certain mood, with a certain wave, with a certain flow, with a certain accent, with a certain background, that you will have unique tools to go and save certain souls that are the souls that you're in charge on their salvation, on their redemption. Now, if you're not going to believe in yourself and go and do your job without thinking, without preparing and planning and thinking and learning about it and consulting. And who's got time? Thousands of people are drowning right now. In this moment, people are drowning. Now, while we're sitting here, thank God I'm standing, and we're talking, 
people are drowning. People that we know are struggling now in those minutes. People are screaming at each other and breaking things in houses and, and, and closing doors and, and kicking each other and cursing each other and hoping for bad things to happen for them or for their beloved ones. And people are suffocating. People want to die. And my crazy students want me to teach halakha about Pesach. Crazy! Sick! I'm never going to teach you halakha on Pesach. Go ask other rabbis to talk about Pesach. You want to hear about Pesach? I'm going to tell you about Pesach that Hashem, the Creator, was not killing us even though that we were not worthy to be saved. That's what I'm going to tell you about Pesach. That you should remind yourself of that piece of information that we've been redeemed even though that we were worshipping idols even when we were in Egypt. That we were not worthy to be redeemed and to be saved just only that the mercy and the kindness of the Creator are, are based on an endless love, an unconditional love to the, the seed of Abraham and Sarah that he decided to reveal his loving kindness on us and to redeem us against all chances, all odds, all reasons we were not worthy to be saved. And he came down to Egypt, him and not an angel. Why him and not an angel? Why him? Why the Creator himself came, came down? Couldn't he say and send angels to redeem us? Because Egypt was such an impure place, was such a filthy place, that the holiest angel would be contaminated over there and wouldn't have the ability to go and to redeem us from there. And us, if we would stay one more hour in Egypt, we would all die. 3,000 years ago. We would all die over there. If we would stay only one hour, there would be no one to save. And the Creator, He saw that, that we were about to disappear from the world. And He loved us and still loves us so much that He Himself stood up from the throne of honor and came down to earth to redeem us. Why? Because we all called Him. Because we screamed to Him. They were screaming to the Creator, Vatal Shavatam, and their scream, their roar, their prayer, raised and went up to heaven, opened the sky, torn the sky to, to half, and been heard. So He Himself came down and redeemed us. And like that He redeemed us in the past, exactly like that, He revealed to us by revealing one of His holy names that is Eheye Asher Eheye, that that is the name that is in charge on their redemption. The one that I was is the one that I'm gonna be. And the meaning of His name is I'm gonna be there for you. That's the meaning of the holy name, I'm gonna be. Gonna be there for you. Yud Kei Vav Kei, when you write that word, Yud and K and Vav and K, the holy letters, the holy word that we're not allowed to pronounce in the holy language, in the ancient language, that we're not allowed even to mention, the meaning of that word, of the name of the Almighty is, I'm gonna be there for you. That's the meaning. I'm gonna be there for you. That's the name of the redemption. The one that redeemed our ancestors, he gonna redeem us now. Where in the world is your faith? I'm asking you. Where is your faith? Where is the faith? Where is the faith in the Almighty, in the one that wants to stand up from the throne of honor and come and rescue each and every single one of us, those ones that are cutting their risks on, on, on Instagram. Those ones that want to hang themselves in, in, in yeshiva, in, 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 in the forests. The verse is saying, until there will be no one left behind. That there will be no one left behind. 
That's the job of Moses, of Moshe Rabbeinu. That he wants to be with those ones that have been left behind. With those ones that are drowning in the bitterness, in the sorrow, in the swamps of despair, in the darkest nights of them all. Those ones that cannot go to sleep without sleeping pills. Those ones that cannot function without drugs, without, without, without something. With those ones, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our Rabbi, that prophet, he, he wants to be. Why? Because he sees the holiness and the beauty and the glory of those souls that are suffering the most from the evil inclination, from the devil, because of their holiness. And not because of their lackings or their, weak, or, or their, or their weaknesses. The reason that they've been destroyed by the devil so badly is because that they are so precious. Who the devil will try to destroy first, if not the main enemy? Who are the main enemy? The most sensitive souls, the most gentle souls, the most loving souls, those gentle, fragile angels. Those are the diamonds and the pearls. And the devil, he knows who is important. And that's why he puts all of his dark energy, all of his power, all of his steam and pressure and impure fire to destroy those souls, to push them to sadness and to despair, to kill their will for life, to destroy their happiness and their hope. So what should we do? We should run and protect them, especially them. If you see someone that is destroyed, he should be your best friend. You see someone that is a rag, that he is so wounded, that's the one that you should be his homie. You should be his best friend. You should, you should sign a covenant with him. You should hug him. You're my best friend and I'm not moving a breath of a hair from you. I don't learn, I don't keep Shabbat, I don't eat kosher, I don't wear tzitzit, I cut my beard for you, I throw to hell my peot just for you. I don't need them, I want you. You're my friend, what do you need my friend? How can I help you? No, but you need to pray. No, I'm not praying today, I'm with you. No, but you need to learn, you have your schedules. No, I don't have anything. What do you need brother? I'm with you. That's the only truth! that exist in this world, in this messed up world. Or else you're a foolish Hasid, Hasid Shoteh, that you see people that are drowning and you're sitting and learning. Oh, you're sitting and learning. Hashem is looking at you and can't believe. What are you learning? Where in the world all the wisdom and the conclusions of those holy books went out from the windows, from all the Betay Midrash, from all of the synagogues. People are learning how to save lives, how important are the Jewish people and the souls of the world, and how important it is to go and spread the faith and to wake up souls. And it's all written in the scripts, in the ancient, ancient um, uh, books. And everyone are enjoying their learning. Closing the books, bringing it back to the shelf, and with the next cup of coffee, they're going to Dav and Mincha. Minyan, 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 Minyan. Who's got time for a Minyan? Who's got time for a Minyan? I'm asking you, do you have time for a Minyan? I don't remember how Minyan looks like. I don't remember. Who's got time? You know with how many people I'm talking in a day? With hundreds of people every day. Every day of my life, Beli Neder. I'm talking to hundreds of people. Who's got time? And if you're gonna say, the rabbi is not bringing a minion. Hey guys, open Shulchan Aruch. If it's written in Shulchan Aruch that I'm a sinner, so don't listen, don't follow to my lessons, to my classes, please, I'm begging you. You're helping me to sin. But if I'm right, and if I'm righteous, so please listen. Check me. 
In Shulchan Aruch it's written, in the book of the Jewish rules it's written, that if you are doing something important like a mitzvah, that you're saving lives of people, that you are helping a person to find his way, that you're learning with someone, that you're doing something, that it's a mitzvah, so you're exempt from another mitzvah. You need to go and pray in a minyan, you need to go and pray in a synagogue, great, amazing. But if now you're doing something else that is also important, or at least the same important, you don't stop that and go to synagogue. You keep on doing that thing. But you must be truthful. You cannot say, no, I'm playing Pokemon Go now on the road, and I must catch some Pokemon, some monsters, and because of that I cannot pray Mincha. I understand, that's a sin. But I never played Pokemon Go. I just have crazy students that are playing Pokemon Go, so I know what Pokemon Go is, more or less, because I never even saw Pokemon Go. But I heard about, heard about it, so I can talk. But when you're busy in saving lives, on helping people, you don't have time. You don't have time, because you're rescuing people from drowning, from destroying themselves. And if you have friends that are suffering, if you have friends that are experiencing horrible sorrow, you need to go to those people, if it's physically, if it's to make a phone call, if it's to send a message, if it's online on your Facebook pages or your, I don't know which social media that you use, and to use that to spread faith and hope to your surroundings, to your beloved ones. Because you can understand your circles, you can understand your friends, you can understand the spiritual communities that are surrounding you. You have something in common with them. Now you just need to believe in yourself that your hope can be useful also for them. And now you need to believe in yourself that you should talk and that your words, your words will be valuable, will be powerful will inspire them. And even if you're not going to see results in the beginning, after a while you will see results. After a while you will see that people will send you messages and will tell you, you saved my life, you gave me so much power, you strengthened me, you gave me so many reasons to live. Because of you I'm alive today. If I received hundreds or thousands of messages like those until today, and I am a regular criminal just like you, I'm not different than you in a breath of a hair. I am similar to you, I'm exactly the same. I'm a Baal Tshuva. I started my journey from zero. We were not keeping Shabbat, we were not eating kosher. I ate shrimps, I ate... Mm, calamari. I even tasted shark once. It was disgusting. I, I'm not recommending. It was disgusting. I was not doing anything in Kedusha. We didn't have no tradition in our houses. In my house, nothing. Nothing. I went all the way down into the drugs, into the darkest places in the world. I went all the way I made tattoos, I made piercing, at least in three places in my body. The truth. And I started my journey when I was 20 years old. That's when I started to learn about Judaism, about Shabbat, about Kashrut. I didn't know. I didn't know that you're not allowed to water your plants in Shabbos. I had to have a good neighbor to come and tell me that I am with a kippah, with tzitzit, watering the garden in my own backyard. And he's telling me, are you, uh, how you, how you call those modern, uh, how you, what's the name of the, the really? Reform. reformed? He asked me, are you a reformed Jew? I told him, no, I, no, I'm not. He says, so why are you watering your backyard? I told him, I don't know, I didn't know, I'm sorry. I was naive. I'm still naive. I, there are so many things that I don't know until today. Ask me alakot about Pesach, I don't know. I know how to rescue people that are drowning in the Pacific Ocean. That, that I know that. That I know. That I'm capable of. I know how to jump into the sea and save people. That I know. Ask me in Chot Pesach. I don't know. I know that you, you cannot have chametz in Pesach. You're not allowed to eat bread, crackers. You're not allowed any kind of dough 
weed, five kinds of weed. I know, you're not allowed. That's, I understand, Chametz. Tell me that you need to scrub the cracks between the tiles and break your finger. And I don't know, I never learned those halachot. I don't know where they came up with those halachot. I don't understand those. Sorry. I know that you need to save lives. In Pesach, in Chol HaMoed, in Sfirat HaOmer, in Rosh Hashanah, in Yom Kippur. I know you need to save lives. I know that when Hashem will ask me, what were you doing with your time that I gave you? 70 years, 80 years, I gave you 120 years. What were you doing with your time? If I will be able to say I saved lives, I know I'll be very proud of myself. Very proud. I will be very happy and honored to say to my father, I saved some of your children, or maybe all of them. That will make me very proud, very happy. I know I'm going to feel good with myself. If I will be able to tell Hashem, listen, I was working hard on saving your problematic ones, your beloved ones. It was such a mission, Hashem. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll be very proud. I'll be very thankful. I will feel good with myself. Don't you have the same feeling? Don't you feel that that's the same thing that you... What else there is in life? What? Put in. Okay, so five minutes you put in. Ten minutes. Okay, you want to dive in the home? Shacharit, great. So 45 minutes, one hour, shacharit. Okay, move on. Shacharit, great. You made it. Run to the streets. Go save lives. You have a talent to make music? Make music and put your soul into that music. If it's electronic, if it's R&B, if it's rap, if it's trance, whatever. Use the tools that the Creator gave you to inspire people because there are people that will not start their journey back to faith if they will not gonna wake up in the darkest party in the farest forest of, 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 of the Far East. Only over there they can wake up. Their spark is over there when they already took at least seven trips of LSD. Only in that point they can wake up. And there are souls like those. I saw once in a trans party, I saw a person, it was a beach party, that person was nude, totally naked, sitting on the sand and talking to a shame and he's screaming, Elohim, Elohim. You think Hashem was not talking to him? I'm asking you. So who was he talking to? Who was he talking to? It was an illusion. Do you ever took drugs to tell me that it was an illusion? Things that I saw under drugs changed my life for the good forever. Those drugs can open your mind in a way that nothing in the world, not everyone, not to everyone. To some people it's dangerous. To some people more than once is dangerous. But for the same people, one time is so necessary for their spiritual development to cross the border from, from despair and sadness and boring gray life to life, meaningful life. To life of inspiration, for spiritual life, for spiritual development journey of, of finding themselves and their aura and their soul and their whatever. The truth, finally. But it's a journey that starts somewhere. And your chief rabbi of your yeshiva is not necessarily the person to guide you on how to save lives. He wasn't in all of those places. You were there. You, in certain things, know more than him. He can teach you in what that he knows and familiar with. And you can teach him. And if he is a wise rabbi, he will learn from you as well. Ezeu Chacham, who is a wise person, the one that is able to learn from every other one, from every other person. If he is wise, he will learn from you. You have your life experience. Do you know what's going on in cults? in South America, in weird places. You know what's going on in the world? And we have that job and that obligation to redeem and to save the lives of all of those people that went to the corners of the universe. We have the responsibility 
and the power to save them. But we need to care. We need to want. We need holy messengers to go and to believe in themselves and to throw everything else behind their backs and to go with a mission, on a mission. Okay, so that was my preparation for you for Pesach. So you're going to have a Pesach kasher <laughs> Now we're going to have another class with fellow Pesach. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.